of Humanity. It is Wednesday, November 17th, 2021. This is the only Wednesday, November 17th, 2021 that you're going to get. So we're going to make it a good one. My name's Dave. This is Steve Edwards. And every Wednesday we get together to talk mules and donkeys and help you enjoy that equine life. Of course, the mule and the donkey are the finest of the equine family. Of course, you know that because you're here right now today. But what we're going to do is make sure that you learn everything you need to know so that you can demonstrate that for everybody else. Steve, how is the day for you today? Got another grand day out there, you know. Ha! What was it, 78 today, something like that? It was real Pretty nice. nice. Um, I'm out here in Chandler. So, folks, we're in Arizona. Steve is in Queen Valley, which is about uh, an hour and 15 minutes, hour and 30 minutes away from uh, Sky Harbor Airport. And I'm in Chandler. I'm about 25 minutes away from Sky Harbor Airport. But no matter where you're at in Arizona right now, it's a beautiful, beautiful time of the year. I got out uh, for lunch, drove about a mile to go have lunch with my parents. And the first thing I thought was like, good grief. I wish I could just work outside the rest of the day. It's really nice. It was fun being with the boys the other day at the car show. Yeah, that's right. Why don't you tell folks what we did? Well, Friday nights we have... Uh a car, car show for East Valley Cruisers. And uh, I'm the announcer there. And we uh, all, there's probably about 200 cars there. A lot of old guys that are kind of living out their dreams with hot rods of all kinds. And so I was invited Dave and the three boys uh, to come out and look at the cars and eat a hot dog and, and uh, kind of have some man time, you know, man time. It was it fun. Was, it was great. Yeah. It was really good. Um, I'll see if I can pull up a couple pictures and we can show them before the end of uh, there you go. end of the session. Uh, well, today's a special day because in addition to our live event right now uh, at 5 o'clock Mountain Standard Time, so that would be 4 o'clock California time, Pacific time, that'd be 6 o'clock uh, Central and 7 o'clock Eastern, we're going to be doing an event all about bits. And there is still time to sign up. Once the event starts, you won't be able to register. And it is an event that's free, but you do have to register. Yes, I dropped an F-bomb. Free, baby, free. You can join us and Steve is going to spend an entire um, session talking all about creating your bidding program where people go wrong with bits, um, what bit you may need to start with. Hey, do you want to use a Hackamore? Do you want to use a Bozales? We're going to talk a little bit about all of these things as it relates to the bit. So go ahead, get some, excuse me, get signed up. Uh, Steve's got his bits back in stock. Finally, uh, all of those COVID supply chain issues finally caught up with us this summer. And there were some items that we were having a hard time getting our hands on, but we've got trail rider bits back in stock. We're going to talk about the mule riders, Martingale. We're going to talk about the trail rider bit. We're going to talk about uh, correctional mouthpieces. We're going to talk about fancy mouthpieces, everything that you could want to know. We're going to hit it up uh, at 5 o'clock Mountain Standard Time. Uh, if this is your first time hanging out with us, um, welcome. We're glad that you're here. The first thing that we ask is that you just go ahead, put your name, where you're watching from, and what the weather is like in the comment section. We want to say hello. We want to uh, greet you. We want to know that you're here um, and we want to acknowledge you. The second thing is that you ask any and every mule or donkey question that you got. And if you're out there uh, with lower standards and you're just looking for a little bit of saving, um, you can ask your horse question as well. We'll answer it and try and help you get a little bit more out of that. And then finally, share, like, and share the broadcast. If you're on YouTube, just click the subscribe button. Uh, that lets the YouTube algorithms know that this is a good channel. And if you're on Facebook, Go ahead, click the like button, and then tag a friend or family member in the comment section. Uh, that's what we're going to do today. We're going to get started with Linda's question. She just put it in here, and then we'll get to greeting some folks. Linda asked the question, Steve, my horse trainer training boarder, a round pin reasoning advocate, is critical of my groundwork with Theo. She says you can only control an equine if it is moving. That's how equines control each other. The dominant one makes the others move. But you not only fail to keep Theo's feet moving, you discipline him, teaching him not to move his feet. I can't see how you are teaching him anything at all. How do I explain what I am doing to someone who thinks that teaching Theo to stand still is doing nothing. Well, anybody can teach one to move their feet because that's what equine do. They move their feet. 
But let me ask you something. If you're right at the edge of the Grand Canyon and you're looking down, do you want them to move their feet when they want to? Or wait a minute, wait a minute. We got a semi truck coming down the road and I'm riding on the edge. Do I want my mule to go ahead and move his feet and go the other way? Nope. Anybody can teach one to move. John Lyons uh, in Round Pen Reasoning, I know John well, okay? Um, he, he, he works a lot in arena work and things like this, and he does a good job. But there's a major difference with what we do as cowboy in, on the side of a mountain compared to being in an arena. And uh, believe me, making one stand, his feet stand still, is very important now let's also look at this if we say okay let's let him keep moving until his feet want he wants his feet to be quiet we could be there a long time why have him make the decision you are not the herd leader if that horse that mule that donkey makes the decisions you will be paying a price especially with a mule so i think sometimes i just wish that the progressives would just kind of slow the progressives, the 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 uh, politicians would just slow down and not do anything at all. It's so much easier to go out there and be doing something and make it look like you got all this going on. It's really difficult to slow and just stay put. Matter of fact, Steve, if we had Jess right over here, and we put Jess and said, Jess, sit down. And then you start going, hey, Jess, hey, Jess. And then you back away slowly. Jess is going to start spinning back and forth. Jess is, Jess is Steve's dog, not a person. Jess is Steve's dog, spinning back and forth and getting real excited. It's really, really difficult to stay still, stay put, not do anything because everybody wants to move and see shiny and see new and fresh. So as I was reading what she was saying, I was like, yeah, anybody can get one to move. Anyone can get a mule to move and scare them and move them and poke them and prod them, do all this stuff. But if you can get one to stand still, that's pretty great. So thank you for asking that. I appreciate that, um, Linda. Uh, so let's say hello to Faye is watching from Queensland, Australia. Cindy is watching from Tennessee, 70 degrees and gorgeous. Of course, Linda the mule servant and Theo, the fuzzy red sweet one-eyed mule in a warm breezy central Ohio is here. Uh, Daryl is here from Alabama, 76 degrees and blue skies. Lisa is watching from Tennessee. It's sunny in 70, she says. Hey, David. Hi guys, glad to see you. Hope you're doing well. 80 degrees and cloudy in East Texas, waiting for the cold front tonight. Bundle up, stay warm, but enjoy the breeze. Robert is watching from Seguin, Texas. Beautiful 82 degrees. Nancy is watching from a warm 72 degrees Mountain City, Tennessee. Brooke is here. Hello, Brooke. Ellensburg, Washington. It's a crisp, cold, crisp fall day. There she says that. Uh, Shelly's watching from uh, Sook, Sook, rhymes with Duke, British Columbia, Canada. It's sunny and chilly, 43 degrees Fahrenheit. Thank you for doing that translation for us. I appreciate that, Shelly. Christine is watching and just says, miss you. Well, you know what? You know where to find us every Wednesday. And today, you can find us twice. Make sure you get signed up for Steve's Bit event uh, at 5 o'clock Mountain Standard. That'll be an hour after we finish up here. Uh, let's see. Linda follows up, says, this gal is also teaching my two-year-old uh, filly to rear on her hind legs on command as a trick. I think that's dangerous. Four on the floor, please. I agree with that. I think Steve agrees with that too, Linda. Uh, Michelle says, hi guys. Steve, do Molly mules mature faster than John mules? So what's a Molly mule? What's a John mule? And do they, do they mature faster? A Molly mule is a female mule. A John mule is a boy mule, okay, male. They do not, there's no difference, not a nickel's worth of difference between a Molly and a John. I've had a lot of them. I've trained a lot of them, uh, been all around them. And it, what makes a difference, you ready? disposition. I've seen horrible dispositions in John's. I've seen lousy dispositions in Molly's. 
I've seen very, very smart, trainable mules in John's. I've seen very, very smart, trainable mules in Molly's. So it all comes down to disposition. That's it. So another question that we got, we'll just follow that up with this one. Do all of the rules that apply, this is from Amy, she sent this in, do all the rules that apply to mules and donkeys as we talk about here, do they apply to hennies as well? So what's a henny and does it apply? Yes, it applies. A henny is a cross between a donkey being the mother and the father being the horse. Normally, the jack is the breeding end uh, instead of a stud horse and a mare be a be the mother. So a jack being the father, mother being a mare, you will come up with a mule. The henny is the, the mare will be a donkey and the dad will be a horse. Now, how do you tell which is which? You don't. There, you cannot tell by looking, feeding, anything, training. You cannot tell. Only one way you can tell truly. Well, there's two ways, actually. One, if you know the mother and the father, if you knew them for sure. And the other way, DNA. It's the only way you're going to know if they're truly, truly. Either a mule or a henny. There you go. Thank you, Amy. Appreciate that. It was a great question. Uh, hopping back over to uh, everybody who's watching us live. We've got Christine says, you do look cute with your hat. So I, I think you look cute too, Steve. You look great. Oh, that's me. I thought he was talking about you. Yeah, yeah this is it's a, it's a hat that looks like my normal hair. So when I'm having an off hair day, I can still have my normal look. Deborah's watching from Southern Indiana. Lisa says, if I was at the Grand Canyon and going off the edge, I would hope the thought would be mutual of wanting to stop before you go over. Yeah, you would hope, but I mean, do you want to take the risk? <laughs> I don't. I don't. No, no. <laughs> Michelle says, Steve, is it true if you are a first time mule owner, you should not buy a mule that won't let you touch its ears? Is that true or false? Well, that's not really true. I mean, they got more bad habits than that. Uh, the ears, if they're ear shy, that is the biggest problem with that is the bridle. And I'm going to talk about that in my program here at five o'clock. Um, taking a bridle and putting it on and off. Never, ever, ever take a bridle and put it on pre-adjusted. What you do is you put the bridle on, you pull on their mouth, okay? And it starts bumping the bars of their mouth. And pretty soon one day, you go to put the bridle on and you pull up to pull the right ear on and they throw their head and then you pull back and they seem now that they were able to keep you from putting a bridle on. Now, every time you go to, to do that, they will respond the same way. And if you would have not put on a pre-adjusted bridle to start with, you would have been fine. Now, I, I have seen experienced people have ear shy problems and not know how to fix it. Okay, number one, you fix it by putting on a bridle loose, not tight. The other thing is always use their nose, folks. Always, when they've got an ear problem, you'll see me do it in a couple of different videos, but especially my video, Dr. In the Mule, sometimes you'll see me using a twitch, wonderful tool. Every mule, every donkey should be trained to use a twitch. Why? Because number one, it's a natural way for creating endorphins to make their feet stand still. Sure, the veterinarian just loves it when he's trying to work on them and the feet are moving all around, but that's okay. Keep going because your feet 
need to be moving um, and let the veterinarian know when you're going to get that done. Yeah, uh, yeah, wrong. So the next thing is uh, teach one by using their nose, using your hand. So as you're rubbing on their, their eyes, got your left hand on their nose. When you go to put your hand up by their ears, if they pull their head back, I pinch their nose and I make the nose uncomfortable. Got that? Mules, you start with their nose to, for training and you use their nose for saying, this is acceptable, this is not acceptable. It is not acceptable to pull your head back and throw your head away. It's not acceptable. Unless you are training another way where your feet can move. And I'm gonna keep on pressing that because folks, there's more to it than what most folks have an understanding of. So there you are. Don't worry about it. There's more problems with these meals than just touching ears. Very good. Thanks so much for asking that question. Appreciate it, Michelle. Deborah's watching. Deb here from Southern Indiana. It's cloudy, chilly fall day. I'm signed up for the live bit chat today. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, glad that you're going to be there. You won't regret it. Christine says, tell my mule mentor that Rachel and I went riding today. We went to a clinic in South Carolina. So there you go. Christine went to that clinic with Rachel. David is watching from Washington, 42 degrees and not raining today. Thank you for the show tips and help. Uh, let's see here. Steve, it was your clinic in South Carolina. We went to a clinic in South Carolina, Steve's clinic in South Carolina. Did you do a clinic in South Carolina that I didn't know about? Several years ago. Yes, sir. Great clinic. There you go. Okay. Awesome. Uh, Myra is here. Hello, Myra. Hello, Steve and Dave. It's pleasant, cool fall day here in Southern California. So another SC, Southern California. Fiona is watching 17 degrees Celsius. Storms are a coming. Southwest Victoria, Australia. Gone international again. Mary Ellen's watching says, Steve, I thought I'd ask my feeding question here with my female donkey. Uh, now I feed her Bermuda hay and I'm wondering how many pounds per day. What should she do, Steve? Well, it's, you know, feed, feed folks depends on how much you're using the meal or the donkey. If they are just standing in their corral on a daily basis, you're going to feed X, Y, Z pounds. Say, for instance, you know, on a on a uh, yeah, 600 pound donkey, I'd probably feed uh, two pounds in the morning, two pounds at night. Now, if I'm using this donkey, I'm packing it, or I'm driving in a cart, or I'm uh, riding it, you know, things like this, yes, then it needs more hay. Now, get this in your mind also, folks, that just because it's grass hay, don't mean we don't have a lot of carb the carbohydrates in there because grass hay, even though it's the best for the donkey and the mule, uh, your Bermuda grasses, uh, it's, it could still be high in carbohydrates. Not so much this time of the year with haze and stuff, but uh, I, it, it just depends on how much use you do with any of your animals as how much feed. Now, if you are going to be riding or driving that donkey a lot, you may want to give it some rolled, I mean, some whole oats, whole oats, not rolled, not crimped, uh, so they would have energy. Uh, but the biggest thing with donkeys is it's really easy to grass founder them, really easy. So you want to be careful. You want to feed them, watch them, that they clean it up in about an hour. If they do, you got her made. If it takes longer than an hour, that's even better. All right. So that's, that's my general rule of thumb. Very good. Great question. Feed super, super important. Matter of fact, I should have put this in there while you were talking, Steve. I was looking through, making sure we got all our questions. Steve's got a free video all about feed talk. I'm going to put a link in the comment section. It's free to sign up for. Uh, it's 20 to 35 minutes, I think. Um, but the information uh, is just outstanding. And uh, as Steve answers the next video or next question, I'm going to put a link in the comment section to Steve's article, Mules Can't Stand Prosperity. It's all about building a feed that is perfect for your mule. You can take the ingredients and say, 
hey, this is what I'm looking for. What do you got? And then you'll want to make sure to build out a feeding program based upon doing a hair follicle sample. I think you could do blood work as well. The extension centers at local universities can do that for you. Or if you know somewhere else local that can do a hair follicle sample, but that will give you an idea of what you need to build into your feed and nutrition program for each individual animal. They're all different. So not any two of them are going to be uh, the same, though maybe they would be a little bit of a like, depending on their usage, if that's similar. Um, but getting that right is a huge part of getting the results that you want in your training. Uh, great question. Next question here. Uh, why are hennies, Linda asks, why are hennies such a variable physically? Some look almost like a horse. Again, they... That you can't really tell a henny from a mule. There's, you know, I've seen lots of nice mules look horsey, but I, you cannot look at a henny and say that's a henny. It's impossible. And I have demonstrated that at different times, especially when I knew for sure that it was a henny. But you cannot tell, there's no way you can tell a henny other than doing a DNA test. That's the only way. Judy is watching from Texas. Jackie's here from Placidas, New Mexico. Beautiful sunny day, currently 62 degrees. Brooke says, thank you. That helps a lot or that's helpful. Thank you. Julie says, can you ride a mule in an English saddle? So what's an English saddle? Why would you want an English saddle and can you ride a mule in one? Okay, so basically an English saddle is just a very small saddle without a horn. The majority of them have uh, no way to put a rear cinch on and have no way to put a breeching on. Uh, the most important cinch, folks, on your saddle is your rear cinch. Look at those English riders. Where is the saddle setting? Up on top of scapula. So every time that scapula comes up, it beats on the saddle. Every time. So can you ride it? Now, yeah, you can. Will you destroy your, your mule scapula and, and cripple him? Yeah, you will. Guaranteed you will. I have tried and tried and tried to build a English type saddle. And it's very difficult to do because you see your mules carry their weight down low. They get it from the donkey. The mules carry their, their V shaped in their shoulders. They get that from the donkey. Where does the saddle want to go then? Forward. When you only have one cinch, notice it's at an angle on all your mules, your front cinch. What's it going to do? It's going to bring the saddle forward. That's what it's going to do. So, oh, okay, we'll put a crouper on. No, then you break the tail and break the back. So, not can't, can't do that either. So, will any just saddle work? No. Very good. Uh, let's see. Continuing on, Brooke says, how much weight can a 600 pound donkey handle in regards to packing or riding? Well, there again, it's our conditioning. For instance, you know, I can put uh, a 30 pound uh, pack on my back and do quite well for a couple, two or three days, but then my back's going to be sore after a while. Uh, or if I, you know, especially if I'm not trained. Here's the biggest thing, folks, when it comes down to riders or driving or packing. How conditioned is the donkey? How conditioned is the mule? What conditioning is? That's important because they can all blow a tendon really easy. So uh, I've seen uh, all sizes of people, especially like when I was in, in Egypt, I've seen a lot of different people riding donkeys, but they were riding them riding on their hip, not in the middle of their back, but it's conditioning. Um, but I wouldn't put much more than about 100, 125 to, eh, I might push 150 pounds on it, on the animal. Uh, but that's about max. Very good. And isn't it something also about the, uh, the cartilage or is, is that what it is in their, in their knees? Is that the other thing that you well, want to be aware of? Yeah, the cartilage in their knees, that's especially when they're younger, okay. you want that to be closed. But the biggest thing we have to worry about with an equine, the biggest thing with riding is our tendons, blowing the tendons, all right? 
uh, overheating them when we're riding and not thinking about it. We got a, a hot day and it's easy to blow a tendon. The other thing is, it's, it's pretty easy uh, when you're riding a lot and you have uh, hot, sultry days. It's easy to pop up white hairs. White hairs is not a concern unless they're really heavy in the front. Uh, and then I also might mention on the kidney side too, because you've got to remember your saddle sets on these animals and, you know, Canada Dream can create pressure points. Awesome. Uh, Lisa is watching, says, I, I never get to be here live and I can only stay a few minutes. Just got back from the donkey and mule hoof trims. What a trip. I have learned so much from you two. This is my first mule. Thanks, Lisa. We're so glad to hear that. And yeah, I've, it's been probably 15 years now going on, uh, hanging out with, uh, this guy right here, learning a whole bunch of stuff about mules and donkeys that, uh, Gosh, I think I've got like three or four lifetimes full of mule and donkey knowledge that uh, asked me 20 years ago, I would have not been able to tell you a thing. So yeah, the the feelings mutual. Thanks for uh, thanks for saying that. Uh, let's see here. Lisa says, oh, and I am watching here from Pennsylvania. Good to have you. Mike says, thank you, Steve and Dave. Uh, Roger is watching from Milan, 40 degrees and cloudy. Cowgirl is watching from Parker, Colorado, sunny and 34 degrees. Uh, Julie says, how much space between the cinches at the bottom of the belly? What would you say there? Well, it's going to depend on the size of your mule. If you've got a long back mule, it's going to be one length. It's going to be a short back. It's another. Okay. Let's just say I, I always start with six inches, six inches. And then you can go shorter or you can go longer. The big thing you want to do is that your back cinch is going to be straight up and down. Your front cinch is going to be at an angle like this. So you don't want your cinches to spread apart. So therefore you want to hold them together. The rear hobble connected to the rear cinch holds the front cinch into place. And then the strap from the breast collar holds the front part of the cinch in place. I feel like you're about to break into song. The front cinch holds the saddle in place, or the rear cinch holds the saddle in place. The front cinch loose in the front. Do that when I'm trying to get a drink. About <laughs> oh, kill me there, <laughs> uh, folks. So one of the things that we talk about in the mule saddle training course is uh, the entire saddle outfit. Uh, basically, now this might blow your mind. Um, when you're putting the saddle on, when you're putting the cinches on, when you get your britching on, when you get your breast collar on, uh, it's not time to get on and start riding. What you want to do is you want to walk the mule around in a circle, maybe two circles. And what you're going to find is that all of the sudden you thought you had, what is it? An uh, inch and a half in the front, uh, half an inch. No, half an inch, an uh, inch and a half in the front, inch and a half in the back, right? That's what you right. want. You're going to have a little bit of room up front in the breast collar and in the back with the cinch for movement. But you walk around in a circle a couple of times, all of a sudden that inch and a half turns into two inches, two and a half inches. And now your saddle is moving too far up on the neck or too far back on the kidneys. And so in the mule saddle training course, you see Steve go through uh, all of these pieces, including where you want to put the cinches. So um, I'm going to put that a link to that in the comment section. The Mule Saddle Training Course tells you everything you need to know about saddling up your animal uh, to make sure that they're comfortable, make sure that you're comfortable, and most importantly, there is no there is no safety, but you're as safe as possible, um, making sure that they're not going to blow up on you because you've got the saddle up on the scapula, and one day they just can't take it anymore. So uh, it's a great resource. It's free, another F-bomb. So go check that out. Uh, Pat is watching, says, thank you for my new knife, Steve. That's right. Y'all get your saddle orders in and uh, maybe you'll get yourself a Steve Edwards knife in there as well. Lisa not says, saddles. "Not well, I know, I know, but they yeah. need to get their saddle order, order in for the, end of the year. 
but yeah, uh, Steve's always taking care of y'all. Uh, Steve is su- this is Lisa. Steve is such a wonderful resource. Plus, I've purchased several items from him. Thanks again. We appreciate that, Lisa. Floyd is watching. Good afternoon, Mr. Steve. This is Floyd Armstrong in Canton, Texas. Sunny and 80 degrees, um, which reminds me if it's it's the bottom of the hour. And so I just want to say welcome. If this is the first time uh, you're watching or heck, if this is the first time you've been able to watch live, you're always watching watching the replays. You're always watching the YouTube videos, but this is your first time ever hanging out live. Uh, Welcome. We want to say hello to you. So go ahead, put your name, where you're watching from, and what the weather's like in the comments section. If you're on uh, YouTube, I think that's just going to be maybe this way or this way, uh, or below if you're watching on mobile. And if you're on Facebook, I think it's going to be one of the sides as well, or down below. Just put your name, where you're watching from, what the weather's like. Um, Also, if you've got any mule questions, now is the time to ask them. Uh, We love answering questions on here that we answered the week before or the week before that or a year ago uh, because it gives us an opportunity to share valuable information with everybody who's watching today. So don't be shy. Put your questions in there. We'll make sure to get them answered. And the third thing is if you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe to the channel and like the video. That helps YouTube know that, hey, folks are doing good things over here on the Queen Valley Mule Ranch channel. Put these videos in front of other equine folks. And if you're watching on Facebook, click the like button and be sure to share the broadcast with friends and family. That's how we get the message out there about the mule and the donkey to more folks. Jackie is watching and says, how old should a mini be before putting any weight on the backs of these little cuties? Um, the big thing is always, folks, that their knees are closed. When it comes down to these minis, it sounds like maybe you're going to be putting your kids on them or something like that or hooking them in a cart and driving them. Hooking them in a cart and driving is a hoot, these little minis. But the main thing is, folks, is is the the cartilage closed in the knees. Second thing is always, always, always conditioning. You know, the more you ride them, the better condition they're going to be in. And that's really important. Uh, So and feed them then correctly according to your use. Awesome. Lots of fun. I know my kids enjoy it whenever we get an opportunity to uh, go hang out with Steve, go hang out with uh, Steve's clients who uh, who may have some animals. Uh, They love hopping on there and riding. Matter of fact, I, I tell this story once every six months or so. But back in 2019, we went down to the Andrada Ranch. At the time, uh, Randy down there um, had a whole collection of mules, uh, had horses as well, but had a whole collection of mules. And uh, we went down there and Steve said, well, hey, how about we we do some mule riding? How about we uh, get those boys on the mules? And of course, this was two years ago. So my nine-year-old was seven, my seven-year-old was five, and my four-year-old was two. And we got out there. Here, I'll, I'll share a picture right here. Let me see. Right there. So those are my yeah. boys at that time. They're a lot bigger now, aren't they, Steve? Oh, yeah. They're Look quite, at Stevie. <laughs> li- yeah, little, uh, little what do you call them, mule skinner? Mule skinner, yeah. Little mule, skin, mule skinner. Uh, so anyways, we went down there. And the boys were just, they were just ecstatic. All they wanted to do was ride the mules, ride the mules, ride the mules. And so finally the time came, end of the day, or end of uh, the second day we were there, and it was time to ride the mules. And so little Stevie, the little one, he he was a little bit mm, cautious, wasn't quite sure if he wanted to hop on the back of one of these big animals. And so uh, the older two boys right here, I'll show you the older two, they got on and Steve started leading them around and uh, they they loved it. Of course, Isaiah, my older one right here, uh, not the one in the cowboy modified hat, but the, uh, the black helmet, he loves animals. And so he was just having a great time going back and forth. And Isaac, my other boy, he loved it too. And, uh, and so little two-year-old Stevie sees this happening from off to the side. And you know what he did? Went, started to grab, he grabbed a helmet on his own, put it on and started giant two-year-old, started trying to buckle it up because he wanted to get out there and ride too. So we put him out there, we helped him and there he is right there. It took us about what, five or six minutes to convince him to come off the mule. Do you remember that, Steve? Yeah, he wanted to stay. 
Yep. He he wanted yep. to stay on that animal. Yep. Uh, he would have stayed all day, I think, if we would have let him. And then, yeah. of course, here's all three of the boys right there. Uh, their first time riding a mule. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, if you've got some minis, uh, hook up to a cart, let the kids ride them around. That's going to be a lot of fun. A lot of great memories for sure. Uh, let's see here. Lisa says, the most important thing I've learned about mules and donkeys is that they are not horses. Preach it, Lisa. That's what I was used to. I did a lot of studying up before getting the mule. I love those knives, Steve. I have one at the barn and one in my purse. Good for you. That's great. We got a two-time customer right there. Yeah. Uh, Mike yeah. says, just got back from the Andrada Ranch. Laura has that young red mule eaten out of her hand. Mike from Vail, Arizona via Chandler. See you soon. Hey, Mike. Thanks for the report. Michelle says, I'm excited and nervous. I finally found a mule after months of looking. PPE examined with x-rays of feet and scapula being done. Thank you, Steve. Well, glad to hear it, Michelle. Folks are always asking, will Steve help me buy a mule? And what we will do is we will tell you what you want to look for. Steve will tell you the questions you want to ask. Steve will say, hey, these are the things that are important to get done before you purchase a mule. And if you want me to take a look, I'll take a look, but I can't recommend whether or not you should buy the animal because I don't know that mule, but I'll tell you everything you need to look for. I'll tell you what I see when I look at a picture and I'll give you all the questions you need to ask. So uh, glad to hear that it's working out for you there, Michelle. Uh, Linda says, any firm plans about a seminar in springtime at Queen Valley Mule Ranch? You know what, Linda? Uh, about November, December, January is when we start looking at dates. And so I'll, I'll bring it up to Steve in the next couple of weeks here. And we'll come up with some dates and uh, announce it when it's the best time. Thank you for... Thank you for saying that. It sure would be good to have you and Theo come out for a visit, or at least just you if you can't bring Theo out. Uh, Bobby, is uh, Carol from St. James, watching on Bobby Carol account, uh, um, uh, Missouri, Montana, St. James, is M.O., is that Montana or Missouri? I always get them mixed up. That's Montana. James, Montana. There we go. St. James, Montana, 67 degrees this morning. Now it's 53 degrees. Uh, Judy says, I need to get my starter kit as after watching these videos, I'm going to start my great grandma safety trained Molly mule from the beginning and as see some habits that need correcting and my first mule. Hey, we'll give that a glockenspiel. We're welcome to, welcome to your first mule, Judy. Brad is watching 33 degrees and sunny here in Nanton, Alberta, gone international again. And uh, Lisa says, congrats to Michelle. Yes, definitely. Susan asked the questions, what do you do for a mule that won't stand still or quietly tied? It doesn't matter if it's with other mules or not. Steve, I'd ask the same question. What do you do with a four-year-old who won't stand still or when quietly tied? Get the come along hitch out <laughs> and start training them to stand still. There you go. So okay, so how... Out. So how would we do that with a mule? I, I'll, I'll work on it with my little four-year-old boy. How would we do that with a mule? Well, how you do it with the mule is, uh, uh, is you take, you put the come along hitch on them and you teach the feet to stand still. Here's the problem with them at the hitching post. If they're moving around, that means that halter is not adjusted correctly and they need to have a halter adjusted correctly. If you're tying them, which is not my suggestion, my suggestion is always you teach them to stand still and quiet without the halter, without the hitching post. That teaches you timing, but it teaches them to respect the halter. So here it is. We adjust the halter correctly. Two knots on the nose. When the mule moves to the right, he gets his nose bumped. Moves to the left, he gets his nose bumped. He pulls back, he gets his pole bumped. He moves to the right and left with the whole, the whole halter adjusted correctly. Then every time he moves, it's going to make him uncomfortable. All right, every time. And so if the head moves, so will the feet. So there's, there's the head moving. I bump it. Now we go back again. I'm going to shake it and ask him to stand still. Now, 
Notice how loose the lead rope is and where the mule is. And then when I stop, I wiggle the rope a little bit with my hand and tell the mule's feet to stand still. And if he doesn't pay attention to me, I'm going to bump him. He can't look to the left. He can't look to the right. And notice him dropping his head and licking his lips. See, I pick up on it and I stop. I pick up on it and I stop. When I do that, that mule will listen to that come along hitch. That's what you need to do with all your animals, folks, and do all your work with a come along hitch. Or you're brushing, you're saddling everything. Uh, if you watch my uh, mule training video, you'll see at the very end where I teach the mule to spread his legs out. He drops his, he drops his body down. My stirrup's really close. I slide my stirrup in, flip my stirrup, and I climb on. But you notice everything that I do there, that mule stands still and quiet without me having to touch the lead rope. So y'all, uh, you'll see in the comments section, I put a link to the Ground Foundation starting kit. If you're a longtime watcher of the program, you know that this is really the only product that we tell folks they need to get. And it has less to do with the fact that it's available on our store and it has everything to do with the fact that it is your toolkit for Ground Foundation training. And Ground Foundation training is your secret weapon if you wanted to know how Steve does it, if you want to know why does the mule just listen, well, it's because of the ground foundation, the tools in the ground foundation starting kit. It's that come along rope, which is a great communication tool, a great training tool, but also a great tune up and correctional tool. And it's also got the rope halter. And so you can progress from the come along into doing some communication with the rope halter, but you never graduate using that come along rope. You'll always go back to that come along rope. And matter of fact, if you go to the website and you just look at our come along rope, you're going to see, I think several dozen comments of people who will say the exact same thing that it just flat out gets results, but you get the kit. Don't just get the come along rope, get the entire kit because it comes with a video that shows you how your approach should be when using that come along rope, um, and whether it's a brand new mule or whether it's a mule that has had training. You need to get out there, minimum six months training, what, two to three times a week? You know, maybe three, three to six hours a week. Three to six hours a week. There you go. Getting out there, uh, no matter what the history of the mule is, you want to get out there and do that and you want to go, you want to know what you've got. So, you wonder why Steve, you know, won't say whether or not you should buy an animal because he doesn't know that animal. He's going to need to do six months of foundation training to know what he's got before he can say this is a mule that 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 has a good uh, a good foundation, uh, good confirmation, good disposition. Uh, that's what he's going to want. So is that right, Steve? Yep. Yeah, you done good. All you right. Done see, good. It, you know, it's I'm really listening. difficult to put two people together. When you never seen that person ride or be around an animal, or you never seen a mule do a particular thing. So that's why I say, if you're going to, you want me to look at one, I'll look at one. I'll tell you what I see is good and bad, but I'm not going to say buy that mule. You got to make that decision. Yep. Yep. Very good. Uh, all right. Let's cruise right along here. Lisa says, I've got a dumb question. Not true, Lisa. Were you not listening there? Have you not heard us? There's no dumb questions. Steve says the only dumb question is the one you don't ask. I've seen people riding their mules bareback. Wouldn't this injure the backbone? Can a person just sit on a mule bareback? And before, Steve, before you answer, Lisa, the first time I ever saw a picture of someone riding bareback, I thought the exact same thing. So no, you're in good company. I'm good company. I'm in good company with you. Steve, is that going to mess up the mule? No, no, it's, it's not, you know, it's, uh, most folks ride, uh, most that are usually girls that ride bareback and, uh, and they're usually far better riders than I'll ever be, but it's not going to mess them up. Uh, it's going to be kind of tough because when you get into tough country or going up and down, then it's going to be tough to stay in a place, but you'll do fine. Awesome. All right. Let's see. Bobby Carroll is watching Missouri. Missouri. She, okay, there we go. Missouri. Uh, Susan is in Michigan and it's raining and chilly. Typical, bleh, she says. Well, you know what? Missouri, Michigan's grateful to have you. You make that, 
you make that state better. Uh, Steve Brady, Delta, Colorado, cool and windy today. Uh, sorry, is it Linda says, sorry to be so stupid. Please describe again how you wrap the come along rope twice around the nose and pull one of the wraps to the top of the head. Half the time I do it wrong and then the whole thing slides off. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do, Linda. I have a playlist on YouTube that I put together of all Steve's videos for this exact reason. So I'm gonna put a link in the come along, put a link in the comment section for installing the come along rope. And it's like three or four different videos of Steve installing the come along rope. So you can see it at multiple angles and hopefully that will give you uh, the wide range of, let's see, installing the come along rope. Here it is. All right, that will give you a wide range of uh, examples to then go back and watch. I think that'll be helpful. Uh, okay, so uh, Tamar is watching Peora, North, South, West, Australia, International again. Beautiful sunny day here. Susan asks, how long is the come along rope? Steve, how long is it? It's the 24 feet. All right, and, there you go. And it's waxed. Yeah, and you'll want to re-wax it eventually, won't you? Yeah, there... You know, it, it goes on the ground and things like this. You, you do have to take some paraffin wax with a leather glove and rub it in. Yep, works good. Awesome. Get yourself one, uh, Susan. Make sure you get the whole kit, though. Don't just get the rope. Get the whole kit. Uh, Pat says, Steve, I just bought a seven-month-old mule. He is weaned and has been gelded. I've kept him stalled where I can see my other two horses, but after keeping him separated for a month, I turned him out with the other horses, and today I was able to walk right up to him in the pasture and pet him. I have your come-along rope and halter, but just getting over COVID, so I haven't been able to use it yet. Will soon. Going slow and easy with my new mule. Thank you both for all the information you share with us. Does it sound like she's going about it the right way here, Steve? Yeah, she's doing good. Good for her. I, I really would prefer, personally, that the mule not be out with the other two horses because as soon as you start separating them, it's going to be a hassle. When you start working with the mules, folks, always, always, always keep them in a smaller pen. A 10 by 20 is what I use. And, and when you're training on them, you're working with them, they do not need to be with their buddies, the equine. Because when they do, you will have a difficult time working on foundation training. So when you're training, they stay in their stall. Now, I use my wife's mule, 28 years old and 26 years in a 10 by 20 stall. And she was the most awesome mule you'd ever want. Very good. Okay, let's see here. Let's see. Lisa says, I pretend like Stanley, my mule knows nothing. He's trained, but not with me as his handler. We are getting there though. I have the come along rope, by the way. Uh, let's see here. Reggie is watching. Hi guys, Wendy, as I'll get out here in North Dakota today, 28 degrees. Wow. Oh my goodness. Uh, stay warm. Linda says, I'll tell you, it may not hurt the mule to ride bareback, but it sure will crush your tailbone all to powder. Uh, yeah, that saddle does help quite a bit. Uh, let's see yeah. here. Cowgirl says, is there a mule riding club or group in your area? I'm still thinking of the clinic. I would plan on, I would, I would have to plan months ahead of time. Are there mule riding clubs or groups out here, Steve? You know, there, there used to be, uh, they're not very prevalent anymore. I don't think they're even, I'm thinking here, I don't think they're in motion at all. No, I can't. I can't think that they, they used to have a good club and, uh, and they had some pretty good riders that kind of stuck with it, but nope, they're pretty much all gone. All right. All right, uh, let's see. Mike says, longtime listener and customer, I'm buying a new to me mule. Where can I get a list of what to look for and ask the vet when I need checked as well? Thank you. Steve, uh, would it be so you want to buy a mule or is there anything else that we should talk about? Yeah, you know, so, so you want to buy a mule is good. So here's the thing. Uh, and, and if you want to have them send me a video, I'll be happy to look at it for you. Okay, here's the deal. You want your vet to do uh, an x-ray of the scapula and make sure there's not a problem there. 
and I mean a good x-ray. Other thing you want to do is x-ray the hooves so you can make sure you don't have ring bone or rotated coffin bone or anything like that. Uh, of course, they're going to do the normal exam of, of uh, pulling blood to look at that. Um, but while they're doing that, it looks like, Emil, you're interested in it's a good time to figure out what vitamins and minerals they're low on so you'll be able to take care of them when you do purchase them should you do that. But remember, the big thing is, folks, just because you see them riding don't mean diddly. You want to see them from the very beginning, picking them up in the corral, walking under the hitch and rail, standing still and quiet while you brush them, pick up their feet, standing still and quiet when you saddle them, standing still and quiet when you ride them. Okay, very, very, very important. Awesome. Uh, Joyce sent in a question, and her question had to do with a downhill hip saddle pad. I got a couple pictures here. Uh, Steve, um, these are the pictures she sent, and she said, Would a downhill hip saddle pad help me with the following situation? I have a young four-year-old mule that only has about 60 days on him, and he has a bit, he has a bit more wider than the average mule and a high spine due to his back muscles not fully developed. I'm no longer attempting to get my horse saddle to fit. And I have now purchased two mule saddles. Unfortunately, both of them want to pinch him in the wither as the saddle wants to tip forward and down onto the wither due to no back muscles fill to hold the saddle properly. How much spine cut out space does your saddle pad have? Thanks for the help. What would you say here to Joyce? Well, my, my pads are made for a mule's back, especially when they have elevated spine like this. There's, it's, it's sad to me to see a young mule like this that has been rode so hard that they burned the top line down. That's basically what they've done. And, and it's just way over ridden, I'm sorry to say. Notice the three bumps on the back there. That's three vertebrae, which that Western saddle was rubbing on, which it, now here, folks, let me just, just give, give you just a little bit of a clue. If they, if they call it a mule saddle, then why does it have one latigo and three billets? Because if they have billets, it doesn't balance the saddle right on a mule. Why do they call it a mule saddle if the back of the saddle is, is closed and sewed solid? That's the reason that mule has those white marks uh, right across the backbone there toward the hip. And also when this mule gets a winter hair, and, uh, and, and it gets really haired up because the hip is so much more pronounced. What's going to happen is you're going to see a line across there from your, your, your saddle, saddle pad and blanket from rubbing on it from the long hair so because the hip is a little bit higher. Um, so I was, I was uh, checking out a couple other things. So is a, is a downhill hip pad going to work for her? Does she, I mean, she needs to get one of your mule saddles to accommodate, like, as I was reading that, like what she's experiencing here, like that, the saddle is a large reason for that too. Yes. Well, sure it is. You know, the, you got to remember, we, we have to have a breaching and the back cinch has to be the tightest. And so the, the downside is folks is when you've got one with an elevated spine like that, most of these saddles set on them. My saddle don't. It's It's got a nice area where the spine's got plenty of room. And then my saddle pad is designed in such a way so that the padded area right where the bars go is, is, is the only place where it's thicker and is the only place that brings the saddle up off of the spine. And that young mule there is already getting a mess you can see the white marks there on the spine in the back, and um, and that's that's tough. So this is what I was one of the things I've started doing, so that you can get your top line back. And anybody with a top line, especially your older mules, folks, when you ride these mules, they've got to be fed accordingly. If they're standing a lot, they're going to get a minimal amount of feed. If you're using them, then you have to add whole oats to their diet so that it won't so that as they're being ridden it doesn't burn off the top line that's what's happened here they've ridden the mule way too much overridden it and uh 
didn't feed it accordingly. Now, I like to see a nice lean trim mule, you know, but you can see across the top of the ribs on the left-hand side there, you can see the fat pocket going across there and then the elevated spine as well. So that means when they, they rode this young mule, they rode it, getting it too warm, okay? And then now, so that creates losing the top line, but it also creates uh, that rubbing on that spine right there. Awesome. Okay. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, Fiona says, sorry if it's been asked before, before but my mule had a choke episode of choke last night. I rang the vet who is an hour away. I managed to clear it running a hose over her tongue. She didn't really panic much. I did. Any tips to ensure this doesn't happen again, please? She gets a wet feed away from competition from other teeth uh, or from others. Teeth and et cetera are up to date. Okay. That was my next question is to make sure that the teeth are right. So now it sounds like maybe is this a donkey or a mule? Mm, let's see. My mule had an episode. Mule. All right. So, and she's feeding a grass hay? She says uh, a wet feed. Wet feed. All right. Well, I'm not much for wetting feed down um, unless I'm going to be feeding uh, beet pulp and then I'll feed it wet. Um, I don't know why she's feeding it wet. She shouldn't have to. But if, if the mule is gobbling down and actually choking, that means he's not grinding his feed right. So he's not taking the time to grind it down. So what I do with ones that want to be a pig and just get in there and eat, eat it quick, quick is I put some large river stone inside the feeder so that they have to move the stone away in order to be able to get to the feeder. And that works pretty good. The other way is to take and put your hay in a bag feeder so that it hangs down and is just about chest high where they can pick on it that way. Don't ever, folks, don't put your feeders up high. They cannot properly digest their food through the esophagus and grind it with their teeth. Always put it where they're down, it's like they're eating on the ground. Lower the better. So you can use a bag feeder as well. Cowboy Ken is watching from Connecticut. We've got Fiery Waco. Is there such a thing as a general purpose mule? Or would you want one mule for trail riding and another one for packing and another one for pulling a cart or skidding logs? I would, my mule would do everything. Ride, drive, and pack. Uh, they're all purpose. They can do everything you want them to do. Well, you can ride, you can drive, and you can pack. When it comes to versatility, there's nothing that they lack. Some folks say they're stubborn, but you only hear that from a fool. Because the best of all the something, or because everyone definitely. knows. The was best it? of them all is definitely the mule. There you go. And oh yes, Mr. Donkey too. Ashley says, hello. Yes, it has been a while, Miss Ashley. Uh, it's nice to see you guys. I've missed you both. It's 80 degrees out here in Texas. I'm heading to East Nashville this evening, though, heading towards the colder weather for a few days. Always love a good bit discussion. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, you can even stream it on the go, Ashley. So if you want to listen as you go, you can stream it. Uh, Michelle says, hey, uh, hello, from work in Montreal. Don't tell anyone that I'm here. We'll have the new, we'll have to view the video later. All right. It's uh, safe with us mule folks here. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Shauna says, Colfax, Louisiana here. I have a pair of full brothers that are jealous over food, treats, and attention. I'm assuming she's talking about mules and not family members, but we'll just go with that. I got hurt badly the other day after feeding, <laughs> feeding, feeding them treats. Not laughing at hurt badly. I just thought about brothers fighting and stuff like that. Mm. I got two little boys. I got oh, hurt yeah. badly the other day after feeding them treats as I was walking away and not suspecting this to happen. I got kicked in the kidney with one of their hind feet. How do I control their jealous behavior? Thanks in advance. Yeah. Okay. Number one, no treats, none. You want to get yourself hurt? Folks, that's the easiest way to get yourself hurt. You just heard it. They get to fussing and, and fooling around with one another. They're kicking at one another. She happened to be the brunt of it, okay? Uh, 
I don't like having my mules in the same corral. Each mule has its own corral to keep from this problem right here, either hurting each other by kicking each other or biting each other or something like that. And you got in there. So I, 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 I've got to also say it this way. If I'm going to give a treat, I'm going to do it because I want to shape a behavior. I've got a mule that doesn't really want to come to me. I've done some round pin work and it's done pretty good. I've done some come along work. It's done pretty good. And I think, you know what? I'm going to try one more little thing on this mule or donkey. And what I do is I take a treat. Usually it's an apple or a carrot. And I put it toward their chest. And as I put it toward the chest, they have to back away from me to get it. But if I've got it right here, they're feeding, guess what? They're going to stomp you into the ground. One of my clients thought it was really cute to take and put a carrot here in her pocket. And that's what she did. Well, one day her carrot was gone, but her, mm -hmm, you all know what I'm going to say, breast was there. She had to have some serious breast surgery. I've got another one of my clients years ago lost the end of her finger because she reached up to pet her big old Belgian Clyde, uh, Belgian horse, and he got a hold of that thing and whipped her around like a rag doll and chewed it off. No treats, folks. If they're already friendly, they don't need treats. If they're already friendly, they don't need to be together because the only thing that's going to do is up getting you hurt, which you've got already. And hopefully you, you all listen to me. Keep them in separate pens. Very good. All right, let's see if we can wrap up here because we've got in just an hour, we've got our BIT seminar, our BIT webinar. That's going to be a lot of fun. And if you're not signed up, uh, would love to get you signed up. I took a picture a little bit earlier. Hey, there's my email address. Y'all can email me. Uh, Y'all go ahead and uh, click the link in the comment section. Uh, Steve's got a lot of great stuff planned for this. Um, click that link, get signed up. It's free, but you got to register. Uh, Becky is watching from Texas. Uh, let's see here. Calvin says, hi guys, my mammoth donkey is very vocal at his feeding time and greetings. After four days camping in the words, woods, I realized he had not been, he had not brayed once. I am puzzled as to why he was so quiet. Well, he's probably got something to chew on out there, you know? sticks and things like that you know okay. most likely now folks you don't have to feed them at four o'clock every day or eight o'clock every day move it around move the times around because pretty soon they'll get vocal and say hey i want my feed here now well when they do that they don't get fed i don't feed them i'll take and put the feet down and wait until they're quiet because they cannot be di dictating to you what they need to do now so there we are and dave we got our bridal giveaway oh that's right that's right okay uh the question this week what is the question this week mr steve the question this week is what is my wife's name what is steve's wife's name the first person i see with steve's wife's name gets this wonderful bridal Wonderful bridal. It was a great show, folks. Uh, while we're waiting for that, uh, make sure you get registered for the, ha, we got it. Susan. Susan said Susan. Susan Farrell Susan. said Susan. There we go. Good so forward. Susan Farrell wins. Uh, Susan, send me a message. Support Susan Farrell, send me a message. Support at muleranch.com. We'll get you fixed up. And folks, keep watching. Every single Wednesday, we'll give away more good stuff. I was going to say, um, in about uh, 56 minutes, we're going to go live with the BIT webinar. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, it's uh, it's just an opportunity for us to talk straight about BITs. Uh, we will take questions at the end, but this is really 100% answering some of the most frequently asked questions, um, debunking some of the myths. 
uh, putting you on the straight and narrow when it comes to the bit that you want to use for whatever purpose it is you are doing. Uh, we had bits out for a while. We had some supply chain issues. Bits are back in, and there's a lot of folks who have been chomping at the bit. <laughs> some dad humor for you there. Chomping at the bit, waiting for uh, the bits to get back in stock. They are in stock, and at the bottom, at the top of the hour, we are going to tell you exactly how to use them. Right, Steve? Yep, and we're going to, in this uh, webinar coming up, I'm going to give you a bit of information. Awesome. Get uh, now, listen, we're, we're limited here, Dave. I got to counting. We only have nine five inches and ten five and a half inches. Mm -hmm. So right now, I'm limited. So I've got to take care of the people who have already been waiting all this time and then we may have a couple left. So if you're going, well, going on these bits, you need to go online, get it ordered up so I can get it sent to you. Yeah, all right then. So y'all can go to the store. If you want to get one of the bits, go to the store right now, get it ordered. Um, but who here is signed up to join us uh, at, uh, at five o'clock Arizona time? Who is signed up to join us? Um, it's free. And if you can't watch in real time, we're going to send out an email, but that email only goes out to people who registered. So if you think you're going to have time maybe later on today to watch, but you can't necessarily join us live, go ahead and get signed up now. Uh, yes, you do have to wait uh, in about for about an hour, Linda, and it'll be ready and good to go. Look at all these folks. Roger signed up. Fiery Waco signed up. Joan signed up. Linda signed up. Uh, Susan, make sure you, she says, I love that bit. My mule responds very well in it. That's good. Uh, cowgirl is signed up. Judy signed up. Tamar is signed up. Roger is signed up. Ashley signed up. So y'all get signed up. If you're not, there's the link one more time. We'll see you in just under an hour. Okay, everyone. Here we are. All right. Bye-bye. Talk to you soon.